gathered here 24 hours after the citizenship amendment bill was passed by the union cabinet yesterday which essentially says that uh, one religion uh, implies that one religion should be pre-eminent uh, in India and wants to lend it that pre-eminence. Before we begin, I just want to quickly read a small passage that I read a couple of months ago uh, and I want somebody either here or in the audience to take a crack at who I'm talking about. So this is what the essay said, it was written by a professor. Uh, it said, and I quote, everything in the man's life, work and background violates the values our nation holds dear. His family migrated from Bangladesh. The place had grown too hot for them after they sullied the Brahmin line by mingling with a certain community. A school dropout without a degree, he founded an unauthorized school that brazenly defied the approved curriculum of the time. He started it on sound traditional lines, but it didn't take long to shed the mask. The misnamed ashram came to harbor aliens of all hues and faiths. You buy bread from Muslim bakers, he wrote to a colleague. Then, worse horror. So what's your problem with Muslim students? The place was also overrun with females. He not only educated them, he let them sing and dance in public against all Bharatiya decency and encouraged widow remarriage. Um, and he did very much more. Anyone have uh, can take a crack at who I'm talking about? <laughs> That's right. Uh, Ravindranath Tagore, um, uh, Nobel laureate, and uh, the author of India's National Anthem. Who I think in, uh, in 2019 would probably have been hounded on social media, uh, probably faced police cases for disturbing the peace, outraging religious feeling and probably sedition, I think, uh, for not adhering to the modern mantra of oneness. Uh, and we hear a lot of this all the time, one nation, one language, one culture, one religion, even one road tax and one toll. I mean, everything is one, one, one in such a diverse nation. So I want to begin with uh, Amita Kanekar. Uh, a lot of your work, as you just said, uh, has been set in the time of Ashoka and Aurangzeb, um, in medieval times and uh, in, in, in the times before Christ. Um, uh, there are conversations between Buddhists and Greeks uh, in your first novel, I think a reflection of the early syncretism uh, evident uh, in ancient India. And your second springs from research on the Mughals um, and um, how essentially they held together a very diverse, uh, not a nation but an empire. What kind of perspective can you give us from that work, uh, from how India was then and how uh, it is now in the time of one nation and one culture? Um, well, I don't... Um one, I mean, was it India, you know, how India was then and how it is now? It was not exactly India. Uh, if we go back into history, history is a different place. So uh, it wasn't this country. And uh, I don't think we can apply uh, the values that we have today to that time. I don't, I wouldn't say that uh, those times were more accepting of diversity or that any ruler, however, um, However progressive they may look today, uh, was deliberately trying to foster syncretism or, you know, was encouraging many narratives or whatever. Uh, Ashoka and uh, the Mughal era seem to be uh, more diverse, seem to be more syncretic because of the particular context that they were in. It's not that the system was uh, more open or more inviting than today. I don't think so at all. Um, I think that the, the context, uh, whether it is, you know, in the Buddha's time, it's the growth of agriculture, the growth of cities, uh, which led to the rise of Buddhism, and, and that creates, that sort of disturbs the situation and creates volatility and, uh, and presents openings for diverse views, you know, diverse views, con conflicts, a lot of violence, but a lot of views and, and movements, okay, which have come down to us, we know about them. The Mughal era was in fact less diverse or less unsettling, you might say, of tradition than the earlier Delhi Sultanate period. But uh, the Mughals were rather, were uh, not rather, they were Brahmanical. I mean, it was a Brahmanical empire thanks to Akbar who you know upheld a lot of Rajput ideas. But the fact that 
um, the economy was growing and Islam was a was a life force, even though Islam by then was also very hierarchical and so on. Um, and the fact that they were not as Brahmanical as they could be. For example, the Rajput kingdoms that followed the Mughals were far more elitist and hierarchical and, and so on, and they crushed uh, dissent more, according to the historians. So the Mughals were not as as bad as that, but they were definitely not trying to be um, open-minded or whatever. Uh, the reason why I write historical fiction, if I may say so, is not to show um, a better time or to show uh, diversity. It's more to challenge the myths of today, the myths that pass as history. Because, you know, I personally think that a lot of good research has been done on the history of various parts of India, uh, including Goa. You know, history has been worked on hugely by lo locals as well as non-locals. But if you ask the common person what they know of history, uh, I mean, it may be a slight exaggeration, but I would say they know nothing. Uh, what passes as, as history for the common person in India today is just myth and prejudice and, you know, nonsense. I mean, my own students at the Goa College of Architecture, you ask them about Goa's history, and they know very little. Something even as basic as, you know, what are the new conquests and what are the old conquests, which is such a fundamental thing to understand the development of Goa today. They, some of them have not heard of it after being educated in Goa. Okay, but if you ask them about Parshuram, they all know it. You know, Goa's history is linked to the 